Okay, in terms of stuff, dead runs remain unchanged. So exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, deadline on, no, this, actually this Friday, December 7th, 11 to 9, 59 p.m. Exam five, deadline's the end of the normal final time. And for the paper, the 50% deadline remains for December 8th, end of day. Okay, last time we're looking at our good dead friend Oscar Wilde talking about his view of aesthetics and the character of Vivian in the dialogue is challenged by Cyril to establish or prove the reverse of the usual claim that life, uh, rather than art imitates life, to reverse that and say prove that life imitates art. And the way he argues for this is he makes a distinction between looking at stuff and seeing stuff. And his claim is, is that we don't actually see stuff until we see its beauty. And what art does essentially is train or condition us or give us the perceptual ability to see. So kind of his reasoning is, you don't see things until you see the beauty. Art enables you to see the beauty of things. Therefore, art enables you to see things. So even with like something that somebody would say, I mean, he would say that there's still some type of beauty in it that you even see it. Yeah, to be able to truly see it, you you'd have to see claims. You'd have to see the the beauty in it. So there could be something that would be like ugly, but if artists taught, taught us to see the, the beauty of it, then we would see that that part of it. Uh, it doesn't give examples of this, but I'll, I'll still from Aristotle. Aristotle said that if we see even like ugly things finely drawn or rendered, that we see, although we may not see the thing as beautiful, we see the beauty of the of the artist who created it. So maybe the same thing applied to, to Wilde. Now to illustrate, he gives the example of um, like a, a sunset, and you can use anything that there's art has been put that done about. And so kind of the way you, the way to think of it would be. Suppose you uh, went to like art galleries and museums and saw paintings of sunsets, and that would sort of give you the perceptual filter, or metaphorically, you know, tinted glasses to see sunsets like that. So next time you looked at a sunset, uh, you would do more than look at it, you would see it in terms of those paintings you, you looked at. And to give like an example of this, some years ago I went to, you know, I thought, I'll try this myself. And so I went and looked at you know paintings in the museum about sunsets, and then happened you know I was driving afterwards and looked at the sunset, and I was like, yeah, that works. I'm seeing this like a you know like a sunset I saw in the in the in the museum. So it seems to be right that art affects our perception of stuff. And so it seems at first to be kind of a radical claim: things don't exist, you know, until art kind of creates them. It ends up being a reasonable but not radical view that the way that art shapes our perceptions uh, changes how we see the world. Now, having done that, they then proceed to a question that is the pretty core in aesthetics, cultural studies, etc., art history, is a question of this. What is it that art expresses? Now back in, uh, when I was a student, at the knockout, well, we didn't call it the gen ed back then, but similar idea. Pretty much every school is a thing, you gotta take you know, so much writing classes, you know, all these requirements, and they had different names for them, same basic idea. And I, did, and I took art history to knock out my requirements so I could graduate. And this was the line pretty much in the class, and the, the standard textbook we used was this, that art represents the temper of its age, the spirit of its time, the moral and social conditions under which it was created. Essentially, art is set by the time. And I recall back those many, many years going through art history historically. So we'd look at, you know, we start looking at like ancient art, like with the Egyptians. And I remember the professor saying about how the Egyptians were building for eternity. The idea being that, you know, the dead would be entombed within pyramids. And the idea is this is supposed to last forever. So you would have kind of like secrecy and, and solidity, aiming for eternity. And then of course with the Greeks, the idea of the Greeks are big into proportion or harmony mathematics. And so she went through like 
the various uh, forms of Greek art, and all the mathematics and harmony except for there, and then going on to the Roman Empire. The early Roman Empire was confident, and there's, you know, the bar of the Greek style, very confident, realistic statues, and then near the end when it was collapsing, you know, the art was all kind of crude and, and, and small and scared, and then the idea was going through all these times saying all the art corresponded to the values of the time, and so that's what art does. And it's a pretty standard line. Years ago, when I went to um, a conference about art stuff, most of the presentations were about uh, the contemporary time period and how the art of today expresses the values of today. So that's a pretty stock line. Art expresses its time. Now, Wilde, through the character of Vivian, rejects that standard notion. Now, it does have a certain appeal, because you, have you ever taken an art history class? I, I think it's probably the standard line where you go through each of the time periods in history, look at how the art represents that, and you can make a pretty, you know, pretty good case. Greek art does follow you know, Greek culture, medieval art, medieval culture, etc. You could say, gosh, you know, that's all right. But Wilde makes a counter case against it. And what he says is this. He says, art doesn't express anything but itself. Now, that, of course, requires answering the question, why do we think the art is about its time? In other words, why do so many people, why is it so standard to say art is about its time? And his answer is this. It is vanity. I think that's the classic um, uh, song, you know, you probably think the song is about you. And the reason is, of course, because the person is so vain. And that's the reasoning Bob puts forth. We think all the art of our time is about us. Therefore, we would infer that since our time is now and not then, the art then must have been about their time. And so we infer that because we want it to be about us, that it must have been about that back before us. But he claims this is not the case. Art is not the symbol of the age. The age is of the symbol of the art. So he tries to take that idea and flip it around. So he denies that sort of standard interpretation. <clears throat> now, kind of historically, we can split art into many different divisions, but one classic division is imitative art and, of course, non-imitative. Now, going back to our good dead friend Aristotle and Plato, sort of with the ancients, most art was imitated. That was kind of the definition of the way of art that art was an imitation of, well, nature, imitation of things. And we can see this in most forms of historical and classic art. If you go back to the ancient Egyptians, you know, the classic paintings and the tombs, etc., they are, even though they're in a particular style, they're very realistic. So much so that uh, scientists today go back to look at the, the paintings and drawings of various species to try to identify them. They find they're very realistic. Same with the Greeks. I mean, the Greeks idealized things, but they had a very realistic, imitative style. And it wasn't until later in art history you could start getting like abstract stuff, stuff that doesn't look like stuff. Now, Vivian claims the more imitative art is, the less it represents the spirit of its time. So, stuff that is more abstract and ideal, the more it represents the spirit of its time, like architecture. Now, the character of Cyril claims that you can see the spirit of the age through these arts. So the question they turn to now is that question. Do the arts tell you about the ages? Now, so far, of course, Vivian has said no. So what he turns to now is an argument by example to try to show that's not the case. And as you might recall, Argue by example, you argue by given examples. The more, the better. So, following that, those standards, the character of Vivian, that is to say, Wilde, lays out the following examples. The first thing Vivian turns to is the Middle Ages, medieval art. And his claim is, is that this art doesn't show how things this is not an you know, accurate portrayal of the time. 
And of course, that's pretty clearly true because if you look, we don't think the people of the Middle Ages had that look. You know, we wouldn't think they would look like animated versions of these drawings. Rather, we think that everything then looked the way it did now. I mean, yeah, they didn't have cell phones and cars and stuff. But it's not that human beings look differently. It's that they look the same. They just didn't have like cool iPhones and stuff back then. And he claims that no artist, or at least a great artist, ever sees things as they really are. They add in as something extra. So his contention here is, if it is claimed that the arts are imitating the time, the spirit of the time, Wilde says, no. First, the arts don't look like, you know, they're not a realistic imitation of that time. We don't think people look different in the Middle Ages. I mean, not in terms of like, you know, different clothing. I mean, literally, physiologically, and physically different. We don't think they look like that. And he claims that what's going on here is a particular style particular school of thought, which he expands on this next example. So example two, it is already by example, is Japan. And he claims that Japanese people, as presented in art, do not exist. He gives the example of a friend of his who went to Japan to try to see you know, all this you know, Japanese stuff. And he was disappointed because when he went there, everything seemed ordinary. People, buildings, not nothing in that that you know Japanese style. And his claim is that Japan is a pure invention. Now he doesn't think that there's a conspiracy of cartographers here. What he thinks is is that the artistic style. You know, think of like if you've seen anime or classic you know Japanese paintings and drawings. He thinks that that is a not a realistic representation of Japan, because Japan looks like everywhere else. He thinks that this is a particular style and effect. So what he says is, if you want to see a Japanese effect, as per the art, the thing to do is not go to Japan, because you'll be disappointed, because all you'll see is people and places and you know, normal stuff, maybe like a lantern or a Shinto shrine or something, but you won't see the, that sort of Stop. I mean, to use another modern example, it won't be like being in an anime. You won't see that type of type of stuff. And if you want to see that effect, he says you can just you can do it in your own backyard. He says just you know just go through, get like a book or go on the web and look, keep looking at these at these pictures and styles and kind of put your mind into that that mindset, and you can see that effect anywhere, even in your own backyard. So the claim there is that these styles are not linked to a particular place in the sense that that's what's there. There's a particular style that we can apply anywhere. That, and his claim is, is that you, anybody could, not anybody, but at any time, you could adopt that particular style. So for example, today, an artist could adopt the medieval style. They don't have to be in the Middle Ages, they could be today doing that stuff. You could do that that particular time period and place of Japanese art. You could do that today in Tallahassee. His final example is with the ancient Greeks, addressing the question of, again, is what's in the art what's real? And his answer is, well, no. Because the way the Greek art looks, all the subjects of Greek art pretty much are, you know, perfect. They, physical specimens. Everybody's perfectly portioned, everybody's super buff, everybody's super fit. And we don't think that the Greeks were all like super perfect. And in fact, from historical accounts, you know, we know, you know, from the descriptions, we know that same, you know, same deal as everybody. Not everyone is like super fit. And so his claim is, is that art never tells us the truth. So many of his main claims here are these examples show that the art doesn't imitate reality, and then what's going on here is a particular style. And you could train yourself in the style at any point. So any one of us could become like a medieval style artist just by learning that style. And there are people who do this today. For example, there are people who do it obviously like sell on 
Etsy or eBay, and there are people who do it for things like movies and plays. They recreate that stuff. And it's learning a particular style. Wallow finishes up with his Doctrines of His New Aesthetics, hence the title of the piece. And these are essentially the principles of his aesthetic theory. First one is this, kind of a recap of what we've seen so far, that art doesn't express anything but itself. So it doesn't reproduce its age, it simply is itself. And he claims that art historians make that mistake to take the art and link it to the time. Or again, or so he claims. There are obviously those who oppose that and say art is, you know, locked into its time period, etc. But he offers a opposing point here. Second, all bad art comes from returning to life and nature and elevating them into ideals. You're probably wrong about that, because how do we just make bad art? But he claims that what we should do is avoid our own time. Because he claims the only beautiful things are things that don't concern us. Now, Wilde, as part of making his point, he does note that only things that are contemporary you know, get out of, out of date. And one way to illustrate that is to think about um, movies or stories that are completely tied to their, their time. That in order to understand them, you have to understand like that time period. A really good example of this is, is comedy, an excellent example of this. So if people see comedies, you know, take, take movies from long ago, all the references will be dated. So unless you're a historian, you're like, why is that? Who's this Nixon guy? Why is this funny? And sort of the references and slang and so forth just will be lost. And so if a movie or story requires that particular setting and understanding it, again, as time passes, unless you're an historian, you're not going not to get it. Comedy also is a similar problem with um, geography, in the sense that what's funny, say, in America, not funny, other, I mean, it's not universally funny stuff. Like the word weasel is funny everywhere. Uh, but for example, um, in uh, China, uh, comedies from America don't do well, in large part because Chinese comedy is different. And so it doesn't you know, do as well. Big movies like Transformers do well because everybody can get into a big robot punching each other. Because that's, that's universal. That's the human experience. So he seems perhaps right about that. Third doctrine is his leading point. Life imitates art far more than art imitates life. And the fourth one, which I think is probably the most interesting and kind of the most uh, useful, is that lying, the telling of beautiful untrue things, is the proper aim of art. Now this isn't new to him. Our good dead friend Aristotle essentially said the same thing, that art is basically a matter of untruth, of lying. And he seems right about that. For example, an example would be things like plays and movies and stories. What happens in them is not true. They may be inspired by true events, but they're fictions. Clearly, like in a movie, it's people pretending to be other, other people in, in places that you know, are on a soundstage or you know, different, different set. And so he seems to be right, that art is a telling of beautiful untruths. And of course, the key part of it, of course, is that it's not just any untruth, but it is the beautiful untruths. And then, while died, and is of course still dead today. If you want to see more aesthetics, uh, normally the class is offered in the spring. I don't know about this year, because we're down to me in philosophy, and I can only teach so many classes, but it may be back, back again. I mean, aesthetics itself is fun, just the class. We now to turn to our final part of our final part, looking at political philosophy. Now, this of course is a philosophy that deals with the soft, squishy sciences in social sciences and political science. So philosophy, anthropology, sociology, law, etc. goes here. 
our focus will be on the political and social philosophy, specifically political. Now, there's a ton of problems here, the most basic of which is the question of authority, namely, humans around the world, we all live in states, and all the states claim to be able to tell us what to do, and a fundamental question is, why should other people have any right to tell us what to do? Why can't I do, as Eric Carbon said, just what I want? Why should anybody tell me what to do? And that's a fundamental question of political philosophy. Why should anybody have the right to tell anybody else what to do? And then all kinds of other stuff comes from that. Like what, to what extent should the state tell us what to do? How free should we be? What rights should we have? Uh, what is the correct system of justice? What's the correct you know, system of, of distributing economic goods? All, you know, all the big questions in politics. And so pretty much anything dealing with society and politics and law falls under there, which is probably like 95% of our, our existence. Now, since there's bazillions of things to talk about, to be use the exact number, I had to pick something more particular, and I selected liberty, because liberty is always relevant. Because the state, well, I rather people, are always trying to take it away from us. So, when it comes to liberty, the idea is, Yes. Roughly put, liberty is freedom. You have liberty to the degree that other people are forbidden or prevented from interfering with what you want to do. So the more you can do of what you want, the more liberty you got. The less you can do of what you want, the less liberty you got. Now liberty, like batteries, comes in two polarities, positive and negative. Now these aren't like good liberty, like to do nice stuff, and evil liberty, to do terrible stuff. What it means is this. Negative liberty is usually what we think of. That means that you're free to do it, and other people are not supposed to stop or prevent you. But you're not provided with the means of exercising it. So it's up to you to get the whatever you might need to, to do this. But other people are not supposed to stop you. A good example of this is the liberty of, say, travel. You, if, you, know, you can travel anywhere you want in the United States, but of course you can't just like call up you know, Trump and say, hey Trump, I want to go to California, can I you know, give me my ticket? No, you can go anywhere you want in the US, but the travel cost is on you. Another example is free expression. Everyone's within the incredibly you know, limited confines free to express themselves, but you can't call up CNN and say, hey, CNN, I want to use my right of free expression, so you know, give me a TV show. I guess you could call them up, but part of Netflix is one of them to call because I guess everyone gets a show eventually. But no one's obligated to provide you with like radio time or TV time, etc. And even things like YouTube and Facebook, they're under an obligation to give you, you know, time. You can sign up for free, but if they don't like what you're doing, they can just take it off there because it's their stuff. So positive liberty is that people aren't supposed to stop you, but you're also entitled to the means of exercising it. For example, if we take um, the freedom to vote, you're not supposed to have to like pay to vote or have to like make your own ballots. This is to provide the means of doing so. They send you the ballot or they provide the polling stations. Also, education, at least in the United States, K through 12, is a positive liberty. It's supposed to be, well, you pay for it eventually, you know, taxes and stuff, but you don't get a, you don't get a bill for public education, you know, sent, sent home. At least not yet, soon. So positive liberties mean you get stuff, you're entitled. Negative liberties means you don't get stuff, but people aren't supposed to stop you from doing stuff. Now, one of the big questions about liberty is who, gets to decide how free we should be. And every culture and society gives an answer to this question. The usual answer is the government decides how free we should be. Until people get sick of the government and then start making guillotines. Then the next government decides that. Now, liberty is always being encroached on and reduced. Because initially, before we had any government, people will be totally free because there's no, there really were no rules. And every time they pass another law, 
that typically makes us less free. It's less things we can do. And then sometimes, of course, they have to pass laws to say we're free, which shows that there's pretty clearly a problem when you have to tell people, yeah, it's okay to do this, as opposed to telling people, you know, you shouldn't do this. Now, one of the main justifications for reducing liberty is security and safety. So the idea here is this. If we make people less free, we're supposed to be more safe. Now, this has been um, kind of the, well, sort of more than a decade, about two decades, from about 2001, there's been push after push after push to lower our liberty, and the justification has been, we have to give this up to be safer. You have to give that up to be safer. I'll give a couple examples. It used to be if you wanted to go to like Canada, you could just go to Canada. You just, you know, you drive across the border, no one cared. Drive back. But of course now you have to go, you know, you have to have your passport, etc. And the reason why, of course, was due to 9-11. The idea being that we lose the freedom to go freely to Canada and Mexico. The idea is to make us more safe. Similarly, um, I remember when I was a kid, you go to the airport, you just go with your family to the, to the gate and you know, wave as they go you know, by, and there wasn't a lot of security. And now, of course, you gotta go in, you go to the thing, they, they you know, check you. They do a lot of sit-ups now because they just pat me down. They do the scan, they, they pat you down. First, I was like, ugh, I don't like being touched by people I don't know in public. I don't think anybody does. But they seem to really enjoy it, so I do extra push-ups set up just for them. They don't want to touch someone who's, you know. But anyways. <laughs> Sometimes they seem to really enjoy it. But hey, I guess, that, I guess if your job doesn't pay a whole bunch, you got to get the perks that you, that you can. <laughs> and so we give up those liberties to be safer. Uh, Trump wants to build, you know, the wall. And the idea is, you know, reduce people's freedom to make us safer. Same with like, um, getting access to people's social media accounts. The, the government wanted, uh, or still wants, uh, backdoors and everybody use phones and devices. The idea being that we'll be safer. Now, whenever the government is pushing, you know, give this up to be safer, there's at least two questions to ask. One is a very, just a purely practical one. Will this actually make us safer? If we do this, what is the reduction in my chance of being killed, you know, how much safer will I be? Which is a very pragmatic question, because if we're gonna spend like money and reduce people's liberty, you want it to, to work. And in many cases, it doesn't do anything. You become not any, any safer. You just give up more and more freedoms in return for, for nothing. Now the second question is, even if it does make us safer, the second question is, is it worth the, the cost? Is it worth giving up that freedom to be that much safer? Now, in some cases, our answer is yes. For example, most people are fine with it being illegal for people to stockpile nerve gas in their house. Because we have the obvious worry that somebody will like knock over their cans of nerve gas and will drift down the neighborhood and kill everybody. We also generally don't have any problem with people not being allowed to have their own biological weapons or nuclear weapons. Again, because you, know, you don't want your neighborhood you know, vaporized or you know, covered in anthrax. But then when it comes to smaller things, things like, well, you know, people being allowed to have guns or being allowed to have um, like dangerous pets, like a tiger or something, then it becomes somewhat more, more debatable. And then when you get to things like the government being allowed to get into everything, all your tech stuff, then it becomes even more debatable. Are you, are you getting, you know, enough for your your sacrifice? Now, typically the problem is, of course, when we're worried about security, usually people are scared. Something bad has happened, and people say, "Oh my God, unless you do this, everyone's going to die." And then people are terrified and they pass all this stupid stuff without thinking about it. And then once it's law, you're stuck with it. And so we have all this, all these stupid laws passed when people were scared out of their minds. And we're like, why do we do so stupid stuff? Because we were scared stupid. And now we're stuck with all these stupid laws. And then we get scared again, and we pass more stupid laws. And that's how we get more and more stupid laws. Because once, once you've got them, you're usually stuck with them. 
Now, in addition to security, there are the things people use to justify reducing freedom. One of the most common ones is basically being, um, well, what critics call the nanny state. But the idea being that people will hurt themselves if you allow them too much freedom, so you've got to restrict their freedom to keep them safe. One extreme example of this, well, we'll give two real examples. Uh, one is, I remember some years back, Florida, when I was running at Florida State's campus through there, they put up signs saying this will be a smoke-free free campus. And they're restricting people's liberty. Because if on campus, I remember people, the person putting up the signs was smoking. Mm -hmm. I was pretty, I mean, I'm a runner, so I hate smoking, but I thought the person was pretty funny. It's like, take that sign. <laughs> and so it is a restriction on, on liberty. But of course, it's not a matter of national security, but the idea is that smoking is bad for you, so you gotta be protected from that. Or it's bad for the people, so you gotta protect them. Um, another example was in New York City when Mayor Bloomberg was mayor, he put a ban on big sodas. And of course, comedians said he was so small that he was terrified he'd, he'd drown in them. Um, but his reasoning was essentially that if people drink big sodas, they'll put on weight, they'll be obese, they'll get diabetes, and will hurt themselves. So we have to restrict big sodas to keep people safe from themselves. Same things like trans fat, um, prohibition, similar deal, was supposed to protect people from their themselves. And so one question, one justification there again is people can't be trusted to make decisions for themselves, so we have to make decisions for them. Now another justification is to limit things that are not a matter of security and not a matter of harm, but things people just don't like, they think is immoral. So for example, people being uh, same-sex marriage, that not a threat to national security, doesn't hurt people, but the argument against it was basically it's just wrong. So that was the argument for limiting it. Similar to other types of behavior that don't directly hurt people, the argument usually is, well, we just don't, we don't like that. We don't approve of that, so you can't do that. And so, so those are usually the three main arguments. You, gotta, you can't do that because <coughs> national security. You can't do that because you'll hurt yourself or others. You can't do that because we don't like people doing that. And those are usually the three reasons people advance. Now, as you might imagine, since people have been peopling, there have been people arguing for various positions in terms of liberty. And we'll look at three of the big positions. One is far right, fascism. One is way left, anarchism. And then there's one in the middle, which is liberalism. Not in the sense of like modern liberalism, where the Republicans talk about to scare people, it's filthy liberals. Liberalism in a classic sense, like not being fascist and not being anarchist. Now our example for fascism is of course the dead guy Benito Mussolini, who became the El Duce of Italy, joined up with Hitler, brought us World War II, and then was killed by his own people. So came to a pretty rough end. But I guess if you're getting a fascist, uh, I guess that's how it ends. I guess that would that be a lesson to uh, fascists around the world. May seem cool at the start, but in the end, you're being killed by your own people, as is probably deserved. So, what is fascism? Now, one problem with a term like fascism is the same problem we have with any word. Namely, when people use it, they can use it in all kinds of different ways, and there's a question of, well, who gets to decide what fascism or any word means? And back when um, Bush, to um, W. Bush, not H. W. Bush. People were accusing him of being like a neo-fascist. And then when Obama was president, people on the right were accusing Obama of being a fascist. And then also under Bush, they tried to come up with the term Islamo-fascism. And so, and then on the, today of course, we have the alt-right and the Nazis, and we have white nationalist Nazis, and they're called fascist. And then of course, they call their opponents on the left fascists. And so people just, basically what it means now essentially is just an insult. It's like calling somebody, you know, um, any, any, you know, 
insult you can think of, it just become a meaningless term. You just say fascism means bad. But what does it actually mean? Well, in terms of deciding like who gets to decide, one thing to do, of course, is go back to the people who started it. And they're probably a pretty good source because they, in a way, created fascism. And so it seems reasonable to use their account, what they think fascism is. Now, according to perhaps a myth, the origin of the term comes from the Romans. In the, if you've ever seen uh, you know, paintings or movies showing the Roman legions, one of their standards, in addition to like the eagle, is a symbol of a sheath of reeds tied up. You may wonder, like, why do they have a bunch of reeds tied up? Well, that's the fascia. That's the bundle. And the idea is that individually, we're like a single reed. We are easily broken. But together, we are strong. We are hard to break. And so Mussolini said, hey, that's a pretty cool term. So let's go with it. So straight from the fascist mouth, what is classical fascism? So this way, when people are throwing around the term fascist, you'll be able to see, is it really fascism or not? Now, first hallmark of fascism is this. In terms of peace, their view is peace is impossible. You can never have that. Now, they seem to be right about that because we, in fact, have never had peace. There's always some kind of war going on. Some, like right now, we get a couple going on. We got one going on in Afghanistan, then of course we got the war on terror, and everybody's, there's always someone fighting somebody somewhere. So, yeah, they got that right. Secondly, even if peace were possible, it would be undesirable. Now, of course, that's different than the factual claim, like there's always going to be war. This is, peace is bad. And most people think peace is good, but they believe war is good. Why? Well, according to the fascist, war is good for two reasons. One is, it is sort of the great struggle that allows us to be great. Now, that view is not unique to fascists. Because if you look at uh, wars where people, you know, before they got into the war, they, they write letters home, World War, Civil War, World War I, and others, good examples of this, is often people were super excited about going to war before they realized like, what it's really like. And you'll see like in the Civil War about people talking about how awesome it's going to be to, you know, whip those damn Yankees or whip the Revs, and everyone's super stoked about it. And people used to go and have picnics, like, you know, the start of the Civil War. People would be on these hills, their picnics, watching people, and they, they, they realized pretty quickly, God, this is, a, this is a nightmare. People are getting torn apart. And quickly it goes from, this is super cool, to this is, this is awful. But initially, there is that view that war is super awesome. And even, of course, today, we, we praise people for going off to war. We have medals and we honor people. And so that does have some appeal. Second reason is that war advances civilization and increases you know, technology, etc. Now, the fascists are also right about this because if you look at um, human civilization, we get our big burst of you know, tech advancement during war. Because there's nothing like people trying to kill you or trying to kill people that really motivates people to do stuff. Like the airplane you know, comes out of World War I, um, development of trains, telegraph, radio, radar, uh, submarines, you know, vehicles, everything gets you know, put into use in war. And so you could make that case, you know, the fascist case that war is good in that regard. Now the idea that war advances, again, need not be just a fascist you know, concept. It can be simply a concept of, well, that's how technology works. But for the fascist, again, it's more than just peace is impossible. It's also war is really good. Now, you might think that for the fascists, since war is great, death would also be good. But Mussolini claims that they oppose suicide. Life is good. But their view is this is because for the fascists, your life is not your life. It belongs to the state. So they don't want people like being suicidal because that would take away stuff from the state. Now, during World War II, we got to see this tested out. Uh, you, if you had a history course in World War II or 
followed World War II at all. When, near the end of the war in the Pacific theater, the Japanese start developing you know, suicide tactics, kamikaze tactics. They take a plane loaded with explosives and crash it into you know, a U.S. ship. The Germans and Italians didn't do that. There were proposals you know, to make these suicide things, but the Germans never really adopted that approach. So I guess Mussolini was right about at least German and Italian fascists. Now there are those who do claim that fascism ultimately is ultimately itself like a suicide system because with perpetual war and oppo you know, opposing everybody, the end result is just everybody dies, which is pretty much what happens under fascism. That's pretty much how it goes. Now, fascism, of course, has enemies. And during, right before World War II, the two main enemies of fascism are Marxism and democracy. So when you, in World War II, you have the Axis powers, which are fascist, and the Allied powers, which are democratic or Marxist. Now Marx, German philosopher, um, wrote, of course, the Communist Manifesto, a lot of other stuff as well. Later, uh, thinkers like Lenin and Mao developed his views more. But here is uh, 60 seconds of Marx. So what did Marx believe? A really short thing. Well, the first thing for Marx was this. In terms of metaphysics, Marx was a materialist, which means it's all matter, so none of that other stuff. So he's a materialist. Secondly, he was also a determinist, meaning that there's not like freedom or free will. And what he engaged in, or what he accepted, was, was what's called economic determinism. What occurs is set by the economy. So if you're a feudal economy, that's why things are the way they are. If you're a capitalist economy, that's why the things are the way they are. So, two of the main main views: materialistic, and so you know, famously no God, and economic determinism. Now, his main thing, which why a lot of people in the West, you know, a lot of people in the world don't like Marx, Marxism, is this: Marx sort of central thing is that society under capitalism work like this. You'll have the bourgeois the owners, and then you'll have the proletariat, the workers. And his theory is, this is what happens. Cap the way capitalism works is that you basically make money by exploiting the labor of others. And so there'll be an increased concentration of wealth as more and more people are exploited and they're pushed into the proletariat. And so the bourgeois will just keep on shrinking. Now for a while, everything will be pretty sweet because You'll have like enough bourgeois to be okay, and proletariat will rebel. But eventually, according to Marx, what happens is you hit a tipping point where there's so few bourgeois and so many proletariat, and the exploitation is so severe, the proletariat say, we're being totally screwed. There's not many of these guys. Let's kill them, kill them all. Except for the, of course, Marx said that some of the bourgeois will say, ooh, let's go over to the proletariat before they kill us. And then what happens is you have the, you know, you have this class warfare and you have the proletariat revolution. And they kill or get rid of the bourgeois, at least those who don't go over. Then what they do, according to Marx, is they set up the dictatorship of the proletariat. And then they create socialism. Now, socialism on this view is that the state owns the means and modes of production. The state owns the economy. Does this mean that the state owns your toothbrush, your underwear, your shoes? And no, <laughs> they don't own, like, there's not elimination of, like, your toothbrush. But the idea is that instead of having Facebook owned by Zuckerberg and Amazon owned by Bezos and Enron, oh, no, sorry, Enron's gone, Ex Exxon owned by individuals, the state would own everything. This is the kind of the system in theory, in China, in the old Soviet Union. Although they have billionaires too, so they don't, really, they don't really communists. And so the idea would be there'd no longer be private ownership of companies. So there may, there'd still be like Amazon and you know, Facebook, but instead of being owned by Zuckerberg and Bezos, it'd be owned by the state, you know, by the government. Kind of like the post office, you know, so in the military, are owned by the, the government and the roads and the schools. 
then the theory is eventually what happens is society advances, it's almost kind of Star Trek, you know, where Star Trek kind of builds on this, is that in theory, things become so advanced and productivity is so high, you no longer need a state to oppress or control people. And the idea is you'll end up getting rid of all classes, no, unfortunately not class classes, but all economic classes, and the state will wither away. Because for the Marxists, it's a tool of oppression. And you'll end up in, end up in what they call communism, in which there is no state. And as Marx famously said, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. And his view was that we, again, we'd have such an advanced economy that people would not have to be oppressed anymore. You wouldn't have to make people work because things would be so so good, everyone could be well off. The end of the oppression. And that's Marxism in 60 seconds, <laughs> roughly a little more. Now, the fascists hate Marxism for, for a couple of reasons. One is they reject that idea of class warfare because for the, Mar for the fascist, everyone's supposed to serve the state. I mean, the fascist state has a lot of, has distinct classes in it. You know, the top dogs, little dogs, and then non dogs. But for the communist and uh, Marxist, the idea is main thing is that class system, opposition between classes, and most critically, getting rid of the state. Because with fascists, as we'll see next time, the state is everything. So the most fundamental conflict between fascists and Marxists is the Marxists claim their ultimate goal is to get rid of the state. The fascist says the state is the ultimate. So they're fundamentally at, in conflict. It's kind of like atheists versus religious people. You know, they both, <laughs> the atheists say, you know, no God, the theists say there is a God, so no, they really can't. They're going to be consistent in their views, they really can't get along. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the stuff for today. Next time, fascism and democracy.